De Bijbel heeft een duidelijke rol weggelegd voor Israël in de eindtijd. Directeur van Behold Israel, Amir Tsarfati, zegt dat christenen de grote verdrukking niet meemaken. Welkom bij Uitgelicht. Goedenavond. Het is deze maand 75 jaar geleden dat de Joodse staat Israël is opgericht. De hele wereld is getuige geweest van deze opmerkelijke gebeurtenis die veel Bijbelse vragen oproept. Bij mij aan tafel Armeer Tsarfati en Mike, Mike Goley van Behold Israel. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Stephanie. Uh, Mr. Tsarfati, you are a Bible teacher, writer and known for your Bible prophecy teachers. And you're also founder of and, and president of Behold Israel. And Mr. Golay, you are the director of operations also of um, Behold Israel and you are Mr. Tsarfati's brother-in-law and together you travel the world giving Bible teachings, mm -hmm. yeah. Bible prophecy. So thank you for joining us in our show. It's our pleasure. Mr. Tsarfati, this year we celebrate uh, 75 years of the existence of the state of Israel. How special is the existence of the state of Israel? I think that the existence of the state of Israel is a black eye to the plans of the enemy to destroy Israel and the Jewish people throughout history. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately also it's a black eye to uh, all of those replacement theology teachers who taught for hundreds of years that God has replaced Israel mm -hmm. and Israel is no longer God's people and God has no longer any covenant with them. I think that for a long time Israel was away from their land and the miraculous rebirth of the land, the language and the people back in the land was a proof that God is not done with his people. Mm -hmm. Just as Paul wrote in Romans 11, has God cast away his people whom he foreknew? Certainly not. So we live in unbelievable historic times of the rebirth of Israel, 75 years to that miracle and it's still going on from strength to strength. Israel is now one of the most important superpowers in the world. It's definitely something that no one can ignore mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I can see the hand of God in it. Yeah. Less the hand of man, more the hand of God. Yeah. So what does it say about the biblical timeline of the times we live in? It's very, uh, thank you for asking because I, I think that if we go back to the time that the disciples asked Jesus for the signs of the end, one of the things he did as he uh, gave them the Olivet Discourse, mm -hmm. he paused and then he said, learn this parable from the fig tree. When you see that its leaves are budding and it becomes green, then you know that summer is near and therefore he says you have to understand it is not far it is near at your doorpost this generation that will see it shall not pass away Israel as a nation and and the national privileges of Israel were always likened to be a fig tree in the books of the Old Testament um, minor prophets and other prophets such as Hosea and I, I think that um, the same way the national privileges of Israel were taken from it mm -hmm. when they rejected Jesus 2000 mm -hmm. years ago and they lost independence and they lost their grab over the land and they were ex exiled for nearly 2000 years. The return is the actual rebirth or the coming back to life of that fig tree. Yeah. And Jesus said, when you see this, you know so that we this live in historical absolute, times. Look, I would never choose to live in any other time in mm. history but now. Yeah. To be that generation that shall not pass away and that generation that can see the most important sign of end times regarding his soon return and regarding the end times. Yeah. Mr. Golay, Mr. Tarfati says, uh, calls it a black eye to, to, the, to the world, um, but we see an uh, increase in anti-Semitism globally. Where does this hatred towards Israel come from? I think that ultimately it comes from the devil and I know that sounds extreme and I know that may sound irresponsible <clears throat> but let me make just a brief case. Throughout Israel's history all the way back even before the New Testament there have been peoples and leaders that have wanted to utterly destroy the Jews and the Bible reveals that it was indeed evil. Mm -hmm. One thing that one person that comes to mind is Haman in the days of yeah. Esther, who wanted to utterly destroy. And God intervened in this evil 
and turned the tables mm. and you see this same phenomena over and over again even despite Israel's disobedience and outright rebellion, God seems to come back and rescue. And so the modern state of Israel and the black eye of the nations that are becoming more globalist with their values, they're trying to spin Israel as an illegal occupation of a land that mm -hmm. belongs to another people, when in fact it's just an, a return of the people, the fulfillment of prophecy, and the persecution and evil, if you trace the lines, mm -hmm. it comes back to a very dark and demonic place. Mm -hmm. And they use politics to paint over that shame of the evil demonic. And I know it sounds extreme, but, uh, but these are the facts. Yeah. So where is this, this hatred going to lead to? Well, this hatred will never ever stop until Satan is gone. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 when the first prophecy was was well given was it was about Satan's future and it was about the seed of the woman and it's interesting because eventually obviously Mary gave birth to Jesus it was a seed of a woman but it's the nation of Israel that was likened to be the woman that gave birth to the Messiah, which we can see also in Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So I believe that as long as Israel exists, the world has a problem saying God does not exist. Mm -hmm. The world has a problem saying Jesus does not uh, exist. In fact, the, uh, Jesus was never a Christian. I always tell people Christ could not be a Christ follower. Mm -hmm. He was the Christ. Yeah. And he was born, the Bible says, born under the law mm -hmm. to a woman at the right time, which means he came to the world as a Jew because that was the plan of God to use Israel to provide to the world the word of God, uh, the, the, the belief in one God and the Son of God. And he did that in order, I always tell people that when uh, the enemy acts, he wants to do two things, destroy the evidences and kill the witnesses. Mm -hmm. And the church is known as the witnesses, go and be my witnesses, uh, Jesus said. But also in the book of Isaiah, God is calling Israel, you are my witnesses. Destroying Israel and destroying Christians is the ultimate goal of the enemy in order to destroy the witnesses yeah. and destroy the evidences. Yeah. And so it will not stop until Satan is gone. Yeah. So, so how important is Israel on the world stage? Well, obviously, Israel uh, is important because, you, A, it, it is a token of God's faithfulness. Mm -hmm. But it's also important because, remember, Jesus said to Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For Jesus to come back, the Jews must be back in the land, Jerusalem must be back in their hand, Israel must be back a country that they own. And for that, we see it already happening. Yeah. So nothing can continue further. No prophetic portion of the scripture can ever be fulfilled before the return of the Jews back mm -hmm. to their land. So if we see the progression in Ezekiel 36 of how God is speaking healing to the land before the, prep, you know, the return of the Jews to the land, then he brought them physically. In 37, he saves them from the ashes of the Holocaust, and he's the one who brings them back to their land. In 38, we already see a future war known as yeah. Gog and Magog that we will talk, talk about. about it yes. later. So all of that has to do with the fact that Israel not only must come back to life, but also must getting stronger and stronger and um, have something that the enemy would like yeah. to have. Yeah. But I, I would like to discuss a little bit more about the current situation with the neighboring countries. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Right now, ironically, if you look at Ezekiel 36 through 37, which is the prophecy of the regathering of Israel mm -hmm. to the land. But in 38 and 39, the surrounding countries, in this case Syria, as it refers to the north in Ezekiel 38 and 39, is going to reference a coalition of forces led by Russia, Russia's in Syria, with the alliance of Iran and Turkey, Libya and Sudan mm -hmm. as well. Those forces have been assembled some years now and are operating and doing weapons transfers and doing all kinds of operations to jeopardize the state of Israel. One interesting fact as an American, also a military member, Israel's presence, even though it gets money from NATO, mm -hmm. 
is a bargain deal when you consider the amount of intelligence, the technology that comes back as opposed to one of the regions taking over that area without that same allied spirit. And so the Bible does prophesy yeah. that these surrounding countries, particularly Iran, Turkey, Russia, Libya, and Sudan, will attempt an invasion for Israel's resources, very similar to what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Yeah. Now, you got Jordan and you have Egypt, which on paper are allies, and they're doing yeah, business with each other. We have the Abraham Accords, mm -hmm. of course. Yes. Which is um, extremely important, by the way. Yeah. Because biblically, we know that Israel will not be attacked by its neighbors. Mm -hmm. It will be attacked by what we call the second tier mm -hmm. uh, countries. We have to uh, remember that Psalm 83, that uh, has been, I believe, fulfilled in 1948 and 1967, speaks of the immediate neighbors of Israel that invaded into Israel to utterly cut us off from being a nation, that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. The next war is not about our name. It is about what we have, mm. the things they want to take from us, mm. which I believe ultimately, at least for Russia, is the natural gas that Israel found, which is a great substitute for Europe um, uh, instead of the uh, Russian gas. Now, it's very interesting that, um, as you said, the Abraham Accord, it plays a great significant, uh, uh, I think, uh, role, because even in that Ezekiel war, mm -hmm. it says Sheba and Dedan will protest the invasion into Israel. And, and who are Sheba That's and Dedan? That's the Arabian Peninsula of today. That mm -hmm. would be the Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, all that area that we see today. That is the ancient biblical part of Sheba and Dedan. And you can clearly see that we're not talking about war with uh, uh, Saudi Saudi Arabia. We're talking about normalization with mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. We already have peace with the EU, UAE and Bahrain. And so that's a, a, a shift in, in powers that we see. The Arab world or the moderate Sunni Arab world is no longer interested in the destruction of Israel. Yeah. I mean, the, the Shiite Sunni conflict is far greater risk for the Sunnis than Israel's existence. Mm -hmm. They prefer to collaborate with Israel to have the assurances to stand against an Iranian attack. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe Saudi and Iran are normalizing relationship, but Saudi fears Iran. They know that, and Iran hates Saudi, mm -hmm. and it is an ancient conflict that goes almost 1,300 years back in history. Yeah. And so Israel is the insurance policy for Saudi Arabia and that area to be able to fight against Iran. So, if I understand correctly, the, the war in Ezekiel 38 you refer to very yes. often is going to be a literal war. Absolutely. The Bible speaks of it in a literal sense. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks of how it's going to happen. And the only thing that uh, people must remember is it will not be won in a conventional way. The, the victory in Ezekiel war is a God victory in a supernatural way. And so no one can take any credit for that victory. The armies of Israel, the generals of Israel, the government of Israel are not mentioned mm -hmm. even there as part of the victory. It's the God of Israel that will never allow anyone to destroy his nation. It has to be very clear. The Bible in, in, in the book of Jeremiah 31 says, as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars are there, Israel will be a nation before me. If they will no longer be there, then Israel will no longer be a nation before me. So until we have a new heaven, a new earth, without sun, without moon, without stars, until then, God will protect Israel. So it's going to be an incredible uh, war. And Amazing it, war. Yeah. It's a war. I'm not sure we'll be here to mm -hmm. see it, but if we will, I would be glad to take a front seat where I live, I live mm. next to the Jezreel Valley. I live next to the Armageddon Valley. I see it every day. I would like to sit there and watch God in action, destroying the armies of our enemies right before our very eyes in a supernatural way. Look, I'm not afraid to say supernatural because mm. our very existence is supernatural. You cannot explain the rebirth of Israel in a natural way or in a, in a logical way. Our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion said, if you do not believe in miracles, you're not realistic in, in, in our mm. part of the world. This is it. None of our military campaigns could be taught in any 
military academy. Why? Because it's all based on miracles. Uh, we didn't do anything extraordinary. God protected us in miraculous ways so many times. He blinded the enemy. He gave us wisdom that we, we didn't really have in the top brass uh, of our leader, leadership. So, so I'm saying the minute you take God out of the equation, Israel has no right over the land, no power to stay in the land, and no future in the land. That's a special situation. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, Revelation, because it's, uh, it's a book that's hard to understand for a lot of people. Do you see a growing hunger for people to understand Revelation? Absolutely. In fact, outside of the church, outside of believers, we have numerous non-believers asking us, what do you think is going on? Is there anything that the Bible has to say about this? And it's an absolute gold mine, we say in English, mm -hmm. for conversation starters. So everyone sees something's happening, but non-Christians are not able to... They can't pinpoint it. it. And when you provide that direction with the Bible, it's almost like they feel a sense of peace and security and direction. And it's like they want more of it. It's mm -hmm. like when you feed a child candy, they want more. Although this is not candy, this is more like meat and potatoes and uh, this is stuff that they should have been involved in all the time yeah. reading. But you think about the Bible, the Bible predicted lawlessness on a new level right before the end. Mm -hmm. It predicted turning away from the truth and embracing fantasy mm -hmm. right before the end. It predicted pandemics, earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars. Rumors Everything of wars. Everything you see happening. Yeah, yeah. and, and a, with a device, I can create a rumor of a, of a war if mm -hmm. I have a huge social media following. Mm -hmm. I can create whatever rumors I want, and fake news has never been as much of an issue as it is mm -hmm. now. And so all of these things are biblically forecast right before the, what the Bible calls the very last days. Yeah. I also think that the book of Revelation is the most either ignored book or abused and misunderstood book. Yeah. So there is a, there's a need for clarity without sensationalism. Yeah. The problem is so many people who wants to talk about current situation pull verses out of Revelation, out, out of, of context, context. Yeah. exactly, and make it look like we are already in the tribulation. Yeah. Make it look like all of these. And, and Jesus is specifically warning us for false teachers and deception. So what do you think is the biggest misconceptions people, people believe in when it comes to Revelation? I, I believe that uh, th it's either that Revelation is not to be taken literally, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a bad thing, and or speak, taking things out of context to believe that we're already into the judgments mm -hmm. of Revelation. Mm -hmm. These are the two big dangers, and both of them are because they take scriptures out of context. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing today, I think, biblical illiteracy. People don't spend time reading the Bible and studying the Bible. They spend time watching YouTube and listening to someone's take on Revelation rather than read Revelation themselves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, half of Revelation is quotes from the Old Testament. And half of the book of Daniel speaks of the events of Revelation. You, you cannot separate the two. It's but important if you, to know. Yeah, but if, if you only deal with the New Testament and for you the Old Testament is nothing, mm -hmm. you will never understand what Revelation was all about. You see, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, never read the New Testament in his life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like yeah. all the scriptures he had to be calling scriptures was the Old Testament. I always say Paul never gave one sermon from the New Testament in his life. Mm -hmm. I'm not diminishing the New Testament. I'm just saying don't diminish the old. Make sure that you, you, you take both, both. Yeah. and remember that this one talks about this one and this one is talking about this one. They cannot be separated. And if you want to understand it well, study them both. Yeah, so it's very important to be able to separate truth from deception. Are we able to train ourselves? Absolutely. And I want to offer two, two very simple steps. Expose yourself to the Bible. Read the Bible, listen to the Bible, get a Bible app, sit back on your couch or in bed and listen. It's amazing how much progress you can make just over a week of mm -hmm. listening to the Bible. But that's not all. Be in an environment with fellow believers so that you can study the Bible together. Talk about it, mm -hmm. application, challenge. 
accountability. All of these pieces are very critical for all of the church. Mm -hmm. And I say, especially during the end, when we have a rain falling down upon us of lies and yeah. deception, the confusion and the insecurity can be a huge deal for a lot of believers mm -hmm. around the world. And these two things, Bible reading and fellowship, can completely wipe out the threat of this yeah. toxic rain. Mm -hmm. And I think COVID caused a lot of Christians to feel comfortable doing church at home. Yeah. And then when pandemic is over, they feel way more comfortable yeah. staying at home mm -hmm. and being fed by YouTube rather than by uh, a, a, a real fellowship. Do not forsake your gathering together. It's a mm -hmm. physical gathering. It's yeah. this koinonia that is very important for the believers. So again, as Mike said, it's, it's the study of the word, but it's also the fellowship of the saints and the accountability that you create and the corporate worship that is so required for the enemy to be out and for the Spirit of God to speak to you. Yeah. yeah, Stephanie, just one thing. Remember the Hebrews passage says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as mm -hmm. is the custom of some. But as you see the day, the Approach. second coming approaching, this is more all the important. more important. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are also a lot of different opinions about the rapture, something you speak about often. We have the pre, mid, and the post-tribulation views on, uh, on the rapture. Um, what is your explanation? Well, I, I always believed in the pre-tribulation rapture, but I think the first thing we need to say that most of the church does not even believe in the rapture, mm. <laughs> not pre, mid, or post. They don't even believe in it. So it's, it's, it's important thing that you know that it's not John Darby that invented it. Mm. It is the Apostle Paul that spoke about it, and it is something that has precedence also in the Old Testament when it comes to Enoch and Elijah and even when Jesus himself was taken. Now, having said that, uh, the Bible tells us that we're not, uh, you know, we're not destined to the wrath of God. The Bible also tells us that he will take us from the hour of trial and not through the hour of trial. And, and the Bible is also very clear about what is the wrath of God. The wrath of God, according to the book of Daniel, is the entire last week, is the entire seven years of tribulation. And that is not half, it's the whole thing. If we're not destined to the wrath, we're not destined to those seven years. Mm -hmm. If he will take us out of, it's out of those seven years, yeah. not anything else. However, the more important thing, I think, is to stick to the fact that none of us knows the day and the hour. We may know the times and the seasons, mm -hmm. but interestingly enough, the tribulation is one of those portions in history that we know exactly the length of it but in days, weeks, months, and years. We know exactly how long it's going to be. We just don't know when it starts. We don't, yeah, but if we know that it will start when the Antichrist is rising. Yeah. That's what Daniel says. Is, so, is the world stage ready for the Antichrist? Absolutely rise? ready. We see the spirit of the Antichrist already. Mm. We see the mystery of lawlessness already at work. Yes. But remember, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says that that which stops the Antichrist from being revealed is the restrainer, mm -hmm. the restrainer, the Holy Spirit in us. When the restrainer is being taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be revealed, which means our presence here is what keeps the Antichrist from being mm -hmm. revealed. It's not like we're here and we're about to look and find who the Antichrist is. No, we cannot even do that because our very existence yeah. stops him from being revealed. Yeah. Yet it's, it's happening a lot. Oh, of I, course. I, I, King I Charles. Read, yeah, I read on your, <laughs> your tele Telegram uh, channel, you commented and I quote, it's time for Christians to stop looking for the Antichrist and start looking up for Jesus Christ. Absolutely. What is the danger of the danger, trying to find the first Antichrist? First of all, sensationalism is always coming on the expense of the truth. Because what's going to happen is this, all these videos on YouTube are making people, you know, very excited. Mm -hmm. And then a couple years later, when, Nothing happened. let's say King Charles, God forbid, died, mm -hmm. the Antichrist is not dying on us, okay? Mm -hmm. So he is not. Then what are you going to do with that? Then you're very disappointed. It happened during the blood moons and all of the Shemitah years. Every time there's a surge in expectation and in a great disappointment, mm -hmm. every time people put their finger on a specific date or a person they think is the right thing. And I think that 
Christians should not look forward to see any of those things. We should stick to what the Bible says, that we are to be taken in order for him to be revealed. But remember, if no one knows the day and the hour, then mid-trib or post-trib are violating that rule. Because if it's in the middle, I can tell you exactly. Yeah. And if it's at the end, I can tell you exactly. And I will also tell you, what's the point of taking me at the end when I'm supposed to come back with him at the end and rule with him here, not there? What's the point of him working for 2,000 years and making a, preparing a mansion for me if I'm not going to spend time there? What's the point of even taking me halfway through? You know, some people say the church must be disciplined. So you want to tell me that if the Bible says, love your wife, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. So in order for to discipline my wife, I need to beat her up uh, halfway in order. Is that notion mm. is, is not even possible. I think the work of Jesus on the cross was enough to purify everybody. We don't need to go through extra mile or extra, um, you know, barbecue in order to be ready now for mm. that one. So I, I honestly think that uh, when you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, you are at the edge of your seat, ready any day, eagerly awaiting the return of the Lord, and you are busy with the Father's business, mm. preaching the gospel. But if you think, I've got three and a half years, I've got seven years, look, yeah. you're not even no. motivated to do anything. All you do is guessing who is the Antichrist, guessing wh what uh, judgment seal we are in right now. Mm -hmm. This is nonsense. This is not for us, and it's so, not for us to do. We need to be ready. So how do we prepare ourselves for the return of our Lord and Savior? I always say if Jesus was coming back right now, Stephanie, let's say he came back right now, in literally in this broadcast, would any of us, us three, say, give me 30 minutes <laughs> to <laughs> take care of some things? Mm -hmm. And then I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Or maybe for some of us, it would be, give me a week. And look, we all know, if your viewers, if, if this was their scenario, we know if they needed to do some things, maybe they needed to make some phone calls, maybe they needed to write mm -hmm. some relationships, maybe they needed to repent of some sins or remove some sins from their life. Readiness is just that. It is literally when Jesus comes where you have no regrets. Mm -hmm. And maybe... You can tell her the challenge that you always give to people when you talk about readiness, the challenge of communicating with people instantly. Yeah, one of the things that I do on our tours is I say, take out your phone. We talk about sharing our faith. Yeah. We pray for our non-believing friends. And I say, well, let's do it. I have them take out their cell phone, and we've actually done this. And they text a friend right there on the conference hey, I'm at a conference, I would love to hear what you think about spiritual things and about God. Can we get together? 90% of the people that our people have texted say yes. And we have a track record, and this is the metric. 30 to 40% of those people are interested for either a future conversation or pray to receive the Lord on the spot right there. So, you see, what, people are hungry, they're thirsty. And, and instead of looking for King Charles or looking for, uh, are we in, in uh, this rider uh, or, or that rider, uh, uh, you know, of any horse? Why don't we just be about the Father's business? Mm -hmm. That's what he wants to find us doing when he's coming. And, and, and the last thing I want to say is that if you believe in a mid-trib or a post-trib, you're basically telling Jesus, you cannot come. <laughs> Not now. You still have three and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> you still have, you're basically telling God yeah. when he cannot come. Mm -hmm. How can we limit when Jesus throughout the revelation says, I'm coming quickly. Yeah. Quickly is there is no time limit. There is no time stamp. Quickly can be now. It can be in 10 years, but you don't give him the time. Yeah. You know, it can happen when he is ready. And when he is ready, we should be ready. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. I want to leave it uh, with that. So um, thank you for joining us on this show. Thank you for your explanations. Dit was uitgelicht voor vandaag. Bedankt voor het kijken. In verband met Pinksteren zijn we er vrijdag en maandag niet. Ik wens u een heel gezegend weekend en graag tot dinsdag.